Okay, so I think we can start. Uh, welcome everyone to our April Integrity Conservation Webinar Series. Today, we have a very distinguished speaker, uh, Professor Marcel Holyoke. But before I introduce Marcel and his presentation, let me just give a few, a few notes, a few housekeeping uh, comments. So then, yeah, next slide, please. As you know, this is part of the Integrative Conservation webinar series that happens every month, the, the first Tuesday of every month. And Integrative Conservation is a new academic journal. It was launched at the end of 2022. We have published soon six issues. This week, we, we expected to have our March issue published online. Uh, Integrative Conservation is an is a interdisciplinary uh, broad uh, Broad scope journal on biodiversity conservation. We publish uh, any kind of uh, topic relevant for conservation from any kind of biome, from any kind of any biological region, at any uh, biological uh, scale. And you know that. Sorry, a second, in depth conservation is is open access. It's uh, free to publish. Uh, we have good news. We have extended the period of of free publication until the end of twenty twenty five. So there is almost two more years left of publication. So then we encourage you to, to submit your manuscripts. We have different format of papers from regular research papers, short communications, but also short, short uh, opinion pieces. And we are very keen on, on policy and practice um, perspectives. So then if you have something to, to contribute, please don't hesitate to, to contact us and submit your, your manuscripts. Yeah. Next slide, please. We also have a number of special issues uh, calling for papers right now. So then we have a special issue on conservation in, in forest canopies. The deadline just passed, but we are still accepting manuscripts. So then if you are working on this topic, please consider submitting your paper. We have also open calls for papers on snow leopard conservation and also on nature education, on environmental education, particularly focusing on China. If you are interested in, in, if you work in this, in, in conservation, you're interested in being a guest editor of special issue, you can also contact us. We can discuss the, the possibilities. So the next slide, please. Yeah, you can scan this QR code if you can, if you want to access the journal and, and see our latest papers. Next slide. And for May, we will have a, another presentation by uh, Dr. Hua Fang Yuan from Peking University. Uh, Dr. Hua will be talking about biodiversity conservation under deforestation and forest restoration, understanding impacts, and identifying solutions. So then, uh, if you're interested, please join us also in May. Please notice that our seminars uh, are the first use of every month, normally at 4.30 p.m. China time. Uh, today, we have a different schedule because our speaker is based in North America. So then, next slide, please. So I want to thank uh, Professor Marcel Holyoke for agreeing to, to do this presentation at a not very convenient time for him. I guess it's around 7, 7 p.m. for you, Marcel, in California. So Marcel is a professor on, uh, of ecology and environmental science and policy at the University of California, Davis. He's a very accomplished, uh, very accomplished ecologist. He has uh, around 18,000 citations, uh, age index of well over 40. And he has been, uh, he has done very significant work on different aspects of population, population ecology, theoretical, theoretical biology, and biostatistics, and, and, and also understanding how biodiversity responds to, to global change. He has also a very, very extensive career uh, as, as editor. He was, if I can say, Marcel, I think you were the person who pushed ecology letters to the top of the of the ladder uh, in, in ecology. So then I think uh, Marcel was, was editor in chief for, for ecology letters for a good number of years and, and had a very, very successful position there. He has been also a senior editor, editor for integrative zoology, uh, a Chinese journal for, for quite a number of years as well. And he's currently co-editor-in-chief of a new journal, uh, Wildlife Letters, that also launched at the very same time as, as uh, Integrative Conservation. So then we are, we, 
we like to see as, as partner journals or as, as, as sibling journals when it's a big pleasure having you here, Marcel. And finally, also, Marcel was founder member of Dryad. And I think that's also a very, very important uh, accomplishment. So without any further delay, I will just introduce uh, his presentation will be Effects of Climate Change and Habitat Fragmentation on Ecological Communities and Metapopulations. Marcel will talk for around 45, 50 minutes. And after his presentation, there will be a Q&A session. So and if you want to make any question for Marcel, please stay until the end and feel free to drop your question. Just a reminder, this webinar will be streamed on two different platforms. We have some people here on Zoom, and we have also people watching on CoShare. So and on both platforms, you will be able to send your questions and ask to, to Marcel. So Marcel, I think you can, you can share your slides, and then we are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that uh, wonderful introduction, Ahimsa. It's a great pleasure to be here. And I'm very thankful to AHIMSA and Integrative Conservation for uh, inviting me. It's an exciting time for new journals launching. Uh, journals that are increasingly international, have free publication, and have a lot of flexibility to publish different things and break away from the traditions of many of our existing society journals. So uh, I think that's very exciting. If I, I'm just trying to st start my slides here, one second, and uh, okay, I believe you should be able to see my slides now. Yeah, we can see them well. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, as Ahimsa said, I'm going to be talking about the effects of climate change and habitat fragmentation on ecological communities and metapopulations. And I'll do that mainly through a a uh, model system, a field system that we've studied extensively over time. Also, as Ahimsa said, a, growing, a continuing theme through my work is to, um, uh, is to study the effects of global change on ecological processes, in particular at a population level, through sort of populations and metapopulations, as in this talk, but also thinking about food webs and whole communities. I've uh, my PhD was actually mainly long-term population uh, and, uh, analysis with time series analysis and things like that, statistical modeling. So I've got a quite an extensive statistical background, and then I've diversified in that with uh, um, people like Chen Chun Wu, who uh, at the time of being a graduate student, came to my lab and introduced sort of phylogenetics and functional trait analyses into meta community thinking. And then I've done quite a lot of sort of conceptual syntheses over the years, such as uh, being part of the original meta community working group and the group that um, gave new energy, I would say, to uh, the ideas of movement ecology and gave that a name. I've worked on a whole variety of systems from model systems in the lab, insects of conservation concern, birds of conservation concern. I collaborate a lot with other people, including um, uh, Professor uh, Jiang Wangshun in uh, Northeast Forestry University and the Big Cat uh, Institute uh, in China, working on things like ammo leopards and ammo tigers. Um, I've also worked with people looking at bird diversity along things like elevational gradients. And I've collaborated for a long time with a professor at my own university, Vic Carbon, on this insect and plant system, which is the main one I'm going to talk about today. And um, this, uh, well, uh, first of all, as Ahimsa mentioned, I'm pretty involved in two journals this, these days. Wildlife Letters is a very open wildlife journal. It's a similar kind of model to integrative conservation in the way it started up, having free publication for the next two years. It has a wildlife focus, including fishes, uh, we have special issues that are coming together on uh, human wildlife conflicts, uh, particularly in big cats, and then uh, about uh, disease and wildlife interactions. 
Um, Integrative Zoology is an international journal of the International Society of Zoological Sciences. It publishes mainly synthetic papers in zoology. Uh, there are not that many highly ranked zoology journals, and this is actually one of the more successful of them. So it's, uh, it's an interesting journal because of the diversity of zoological papers it gets and publishes, so worth a look. Okay, so I'm going to talk today about climate change and spatial dynamics. I'm going to ask what are the most relevant changes in weather and climate that's, that plant and insect interactions in particular experience. I'm going to view that talking about species interactions and also long-term population dynamics. And we have data and experiments on both. I'll talk about the effects of changes in precipitation, temperature, and ultraviolet radiation on species interactions in this one system. I'll talk about changes in the spatial structure of populations. These are a bit speculative, but I think are, are interesting and worth talking about. And then I'll talk about long-term changes in climate regimes that are ongoing and changes in precipitation and population cycles in this system that are resulting. Okay, so as a starting point, if we look at what's expected for climate change, such as IPCC reports, this one back from 2021, for example, we could get predictions of future climate warming being greater at higher latitudes and in winter months. We get more varied predictions of precipitation around the world. And for places uh, like uh, California, for example, or also uh, for um, parts of China, whether there is predicted to be an increase or decrease in precipitation depends on the extent of, war of climate warming that occurs. Different models make varied predictions about precipitation in some areas. Uh, and uh, in the areas that are expected to see the greatest precipitation changes are actually places like the Sahara Desert, where it's expected to become markedly wetter uh, and perhaps even returning to a grassland habitat in the future, radical changes potentially. Um, but more varied and not known predictions for places like California, where I'll talk about the studies today. The IPCC have also concluded that extreme weather events are increasing, in particular hot extremes of weather increasing, cold extremes of weather actually decreasing somewhat, heavy precipitation events and potentially flooding events and things are incre increasing, and then we're getting longer heat waves, more droughts, more weather that's associated with fires is relevant to California, and increased flooding in some locations. So more extreme events today. These changes are particularly relevant to ectothermic species that have little ability to buffer against change. There could be um, still be multiple layers of complexity associated with things like timing as well as uh, things like species interactions. There are direct effects of warming. So for example, thinking about the development rate of an insect, for example, as being temperature dependent. Then there are indirect effects that involve other species or interactors, and there the possibilities for change become even more complex because of uh, the climate affecting either the interactor or the or our target organism directly and in potentially different ways. So those changes are, are some of the harder ones to predict, along with th uh, things like changes in the distribution of organisms, I think also make things complex, but I'm not going to talk about those today. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a system that is based on one target herbivore called Ranchman's tiger moth in English, Arctia virginialis. It's an arctoid moth and the caterpillars and the adult moths are quite uh, recognizable. The moths 
uh, are brightly colored. The caterpillars have a common name of woolly bears uh, because of their woolly uh, caterpillar appearance. And the caterpillars actually march around uh, at certain developmental stages and are quite visible uh, species walking across the ground. This work has been read, led by Professor uh, Rick Carbon at my university. Rick is uh, just re uh, recently retired. There are various graduate students, Adam Pepe and Patrick Grove Tisa, uh, uh, who have contributed to this work in particular today, but quite a lot of other people over the years uh, have done research in this system. Now, the tiger moth has one generation per year. It's a generalist herbivore. It has important interactions with parasitoid wasps, with viruses that are entomopathomogenic, and ants as predators, potentially also vertebrate predators, but those we actually have less information about, so I'm not going to talk about those very much. Um, the, as I said, the early instars, the caterpillars, are uh, quite visible. They are limited by food resources in some years in particular. And these caterpillars have been censored by Rick Carbon since 1986. He would go out and count the number of caterpillars at a certain time of year on a standard number of bushes at a number of sites in uh, our study location. Our study location is the Bodega Marine Laboratory, which is about uh, something like 60 kilometers north of San Francisco in California, so Northern California. Um, it is fairly cool uh, year round. It doesn't get very extreme hot, uh, hot but is generally warmer in summer than in winter. Uh, the site contains a mix of habitats. It has dry sand dune locations, and you can see sand dunes here, for example. In other places, the vegetation is quite wet, and uh, that vegetation tends to remain wet. And so there's two types of, stud of study locations within this, um, this one area. Here is uh, Bodega at about this time of year, very scenic uh, location with a small uh, in enclosed cove here. This is the marine laboratory that has um, things like labs in it and a few classrooms and lecture rooms and things. A wonderful place for teaching field courses and so on. Um, the, uh, the wildflowers are also fantastic and amazing views of the ocean. The caterpillars we have studied for a long time, as I said. Early on, we found out that our wet study sites, the marsh sites, on average contained slightly more caterpillars and uh, they uh, tended to have higher variation in numbers of caterpillars. So wet sites tended to have more caterpillars. Also, if you look across years, wet years with more precipitation tended to have more of these caterpillars per bush. It's a lot of variation again, but it is a significant pattern. And then we also observed fairly early on that some of the sites crash in the numbers of caterpillars. The numbers of caterpillars per shrub goes down to actually to zero, and we cannot find any caterpillars at those sites. Uh, in some years. There appears to be a local extinction. So these dry sites in yellow here at the top of the table experienced extinctions in 2009, these ones in 2010. These wet sites at the bottom did not experience extinctions. And not only that, is there an extinction of the caterpillars in some of our study locations in some dry years? which tells you immediately we expect an effect of precipitation. Um, there is also a noticeable movement of caterpillars. So um, as I said, you can see these caterpillars walking around 
at certain times of year. So probably in about May or June of each year, uh, you could walk uh, uh, the road that runs across the field station and you would see these caterpillars crossing the road. And we did two things. We um, just recorded which direction caterpillars were going uh, for, a, for a, a while and noticed that caterpillars were disproportionately crossing the road from wet to dry sites with 59 of 76 and the other 17 seemed to go in the opposite direction. Then we also put caterpillars in the middle of the road and looked at what direction they go. To our surprise, when we did this, the majority of the caterpillars in 16 of 20 cohorts of caterpillars we put out, I think it was like 20 caterpillars per cohort or something, they went towards the dry sites. They seemed to be capable of knowing which way the drier sites were. So there seems to be this movement that is going on from the wet locations that have more caterpillars and more persistent populations to the dry sites. So it seems to be sort of a source to sink movement that goes on. And that's how we've characterized it as a source sink system with extinction of our sinks occurring in some dry years. And that seems to hold for the, uh, the system. The total numbers of caterpillars are small enough that we think that that uh, contributes to the local extinction in some years. And they're actually, uh, if we look from site to site, it's not that there are predi uh, predictably that a site will have lots more caterpillars than another. The wet sites on average have more than the dry sites, but the wet sites also vary from site to site in how many they have uh, at various points in time. And it seems to be associated with some longer term, perhaps nutrient dynamics that are ongoing in the shrubs that the, um, the caterpillars are feeding on, which are uh, predominantly uh, bush lupins. So that's the sort of single sort of um, spatial dynamic that we have, which seems to be driven by rainfall. We are also interested in predation in these systems. There is a native ant for Michaelasioides. We put small caterpillars out in uh, a container in the uh, on the on the ground uh, and left them there for 24 hours. Uh, uh, we covered them to keep birds out and small mammals out, but they would be gone gone after 24 hours. And also, if we put ant baits out, ants would readily recruit to those sites. And then in the lab if we put ants and caterpillars together, we readily saw predation occurring. So we knew ants were potentially important predators. We'd also observed that there seemed to be diseased caterpillars uh, present in the system. Um, the, uh, this is a non-hairy caterpillar where it's easier to see, and you can see that it, uh, this species of caterpillar has gone limp uh, and appears to be dying. Um, and these bacular virus pathogens are potential culprits for that. And we were able to confirm the, uh, the presence of a bacular virus in our, uh, the moth species and uh, to carry out some studies of that that I'll talk about uh, after the, um, the ant predation stuff. And on that one, we were particularly interested in the effects of UV radiation. And that is because these bacular viruses are known to be very sensitive to UV radiation. So we decided to look at that uh, in our study system. Okay, so we wanted to ask, what is the effect of rainfall? Uh, are there direct effects on caterpillars versus indirect effects on predation? 
what does temperature do to predation? With warmer temperatures, we expect a more rapid development of the caterpillars, but we might also expect that the ants might be warm enough to be active for more of the time. So predation might also increase. So it's complicated to predict what temperature will do. And then we were interested in what effect pathogens have in this system and are they affected by UV radiation and perhaps not so much by temperature or rainfall, which is what we would um, might expect based on the existing literature. Then I'm going to end by talking about the effects of long-term population dynamics and the implications for the spatial dynamics beyond that that I've talked about already. Okay, so here's some uh, what we thought of as possible effects of wetness of sites uh, indirectly linked to precipitation on the caterpillar abundance. So we've got caterpillar abundance over on our right here and we've got precipitation on our left. One pathway they might be li linked is quite simple, that when, it, when there's more rain, plants grow more, that leads to uh, not just more plants to feed on, it also leads to more leaf litter. Now, we believed that leaf litter in this system was important for our caterpillars to be able to hide in it. When our caterpillars are young, they are down in the leaf litter feeding there. They are hard to find. It's only once they get a bit bigger and are up feeding on the leaves of the plants that we can actually find them. So we expected that leaf litter was important and we speculated it was important to predation. And then we also know that precipitation and site wetness was linked to ant abundance. Okay, And I'll show you that as well. We investigated three possible mechanisms, increased plant growth benefiting caterpillars, the precipitation decreasing ant abundance, and then a more indirect effect still through litter as a predation refuge for ants, such that precipitation increased the amount of leaf litter, increased the refuge effect that was present and protected caterpillars from uh, predation. So, so precipitation could be good for caterpillar abundance in that way. So we know from general um, analyses, such as this one, I could connected this with Brad Hawkins in 1998, it was published in the American Naturalist. We look for long-term data on insect herbivores. We took ones that have a decent amount of long-term data within this period of time that's shown on the axis here. Uh, and we um, looked at how much rainfall was there. So zero is average rainfall here. This is a wetter than average year. These are drier than average years. And then we looked at the average insect abundance uh, for herbivores in these wet periods and dry periods. You can see that there is a strong relationship here that uh, in wetter years, we have higher insect abundances than average and lower than average insect abundances in drier years. That's a sort of simple effect of the amount of food that's present that we expect. Okay, so that was the first mechanism that we looked at. In our study system, we did direct experiments on this, and I'm going to bother showing you the results. It was a rather small effect. So there is an effect of the amount of vegetation uh, as food, but it's a rather small effect for our caterpillars. We could measure it, but it was rather small. Okay, so I'm not going to sort of uh, show you much more of that. The graph is not very impressive, uh, so I'm going to uh, pretty much skip it. So that's the expected effect. Um, we do know that in our system, there's a higher abundance of caterpillars as well. Um, so it's not just uh, the si size of the caterpillars and they're more abundant. So there is this sort of general effect that's going on. It's not a big effect, as I said. So what about through uh, ant predation on our caterpillars? And so this is investigating uh, decreased ant abundance and litter as a predation refuge. 
from putting out baits and censusing ants, we can I can tell you that there's uh, fewer ants of the main ant species and then ants of all species. There's fewer ants at wet sites than dry sites on average. OK, and this is sort of controlled surveys by putting out baits and counting the number of ants that recruit. So wet sites have fewer ants, which could benefit the caterpillars in their survival. If we look at the uh, survival of caterpillars, so if you put caterpillars out in a uh, container where ants have access but nothing else has access um, in our wet sites and dry sites in litter, we find that there is slightly higher survival of caterpillars in the wet litter than the dry litter. The wet litter seems to um, be better at keeping its structure and being harder for the ants to search, to uh, um, predate the caterpillars in. If we look um, overall, we find that um, wet sites have higher caterpillar survival. And this was true irrespective of the number of ants. So if we standardize the number of ants, we find still higher survival in wet uh, sites than dry sites. The difference between wet and dry was about 0.2 probability of caterpillar survival. The um, difference in um, the ant density is slightly larger. It's 0.3 to 0.4 um, difference in survival of our caterpillars. Um, uh, to maturity. So a, um, a benefit of being in wet sites for our caterpillars. Okay, so what I've shown you overall is um, that there was a small increase from plant uh, growth with increased precipitation, a substantial effect of ant abundance, and an even more substantial effect of litter as a predation refuge. So basically, Precipitation increasing has triple benefit for uh, the survival of our caterpillars. And the predictions for our sites are most likely that there will be a slight increase in precipitation. Under some climate scenarios, we get a more substantial decrease in precipitation. So it sort of varies depending on the climate scenario that is um, uh, modeled for our study site, whether there's going to be a net benefit or increase from future precipitation changes. Future precipitation um, decreasing would increase the source to sink dynamic that goes on by changing the importance of the wet sites and having dry sites that are increasingly dry. So there could be a, an increase in the source to sink dynamic that goes on, whereas a relaxation of that dynamic if uh, precipitation uh, increases. Okay, so what about temperature? Now, in this predation scenario, there's three components to inter the interaction. There's size predict dependent predation. Once the caterpillars become large enough, the ants cannot kill them uh, readily. There is also temperature dependent predation. The ants are more active when it's warmer up to a certain point. And then there is temperature dependent growth of the caterpillars. Caterpillars grow faster when it's warmer. So their time to reach this um, size at which they're no longer vulnerable to predation may be decreased. So we looked at that with an experiment. We put out solar canopies and mop canopies with ventilation, which differentially warmed lupin bushes underneath with uh, ants, uh, with caterpillars uh, inside of the uh, cages where they were contained and um, with or without ant predation going on, depending on the kind of cage we use, uh, smaller cage within these tents that we used. So we controlled predation and warming uh, in this. We also did more controlled lab experiments. And this graph here is a summary of all of those lab and field experiments combined. 
basically, um, this is showing you the predation uh, size refuge where larger caterpillars are more likely to survive from ant predation. Um, you can see that as temperature increases, the survival for uh, the caterpillars actually goes down, okay? So even though caterpillars are growing faster, their probability of survival goes down, even though their growth rate went up with temperature, okay? Um, so there's net decline in survival with temperature. We modeled that uh, statistically, we put together a model. Okay, I'll just show you the, uh, the summary graph of this. So the overall effect of temperature um, was that survival declined with temperature, as I said. If we took out the um, temperature dependent increases in predation, then survival would be expected to increase, increase greatly to 100% pretty much. If the um, took out size dependent predation from our model, then survival was always low because predation was always occurring. And then you put together the predation uh, um, without the temperature dependent growth, you see there's a lower survival, then you have the increase in growth, and that's the overall average effect that we saw with increased caterpillar growth, increased predation, but decreased time to reach the size uh, refuge going on. So that's the combination of things that are going on. So temperature is expected to reduce caterpillar survival. We uh, All of the predictions for our sites are that, um, that temperature will increase and will reduce the survival of caterpillars. So we might see overall declines in abundance, perhaps more frequent uh, sink extinctions in our dry sites uh, in this system, and perhaps even some losses of some of the smaller uh, wet sites, uh, particularly if they become more dry with increased temperature. So the habitat changes, we don't really have data here on, our, on here to know whether there's going to be a net increase in the number of dry versus wet sites in the system. And that also obviously depends on rainfall. So uh, interesting predictions there. Now, the, this virus, uh, we were interested in, and it's known to, these bacular viruses are known to kill many Lepidoptera. They can persist in the environment through having a protein coat um, uh, in occlusion bodies. These occlusion bodies have a reservoir in the soil. They um, are ingest. They also are deposited in the feces of caterpillars that have eaten them, and the feces of birds that have eaten the infected caterpillars, and deposited on leaves and other plant surfaces. They uh, they may be uh, broken down by ultraviolet radiation, and the unoccluded virus is very sensitive to ultraviolet radiation. So the consumption of these occlusion bodies and the live virus occasionally uh, um, would increase the uh, infection of our caterpillars, and the caterpillars can die uh, shortly afterwards. Okay, so. We predicted, based on what we know about uh, caterpillar and virus dynamics, that there would be a delayed density dependent effect of uh, infection. So a higher density of caterpillars would have a delayed density dependent effect on future survival of those caterpillars. We expected decreases in infection with higher levels of ultraviolet radiation. We, infect, we expected also that infection severity um, may actually alter the survival of the caterpillars. So there's a dose dependent effect depending on growth density and UV um, in our system, we expected. So we tested this by doing a large scale survey. And this is mainly due to the, my former PhD student, Adam Pepe. He went from close to Vancouver uh, in uh, so you have Washington State here uh, around Seattle. You have um, 
uh, sites through Oregon and then sites to uh, down about as far as somewhere like Santa Cruz and south of San Francisco in California. Bodega is up here with various sites around it. We collected caterpillars at 23 different sites over two years. We reared those caterpillars. We dissected them to assess their infection. In the virus and infecting them, sorry, in dissecting them, you can see that um, there are, uh, in the gut, you can see these particles that have a protein coat. The coat is visible when stained appropriately, and you can actually uh, see the uh, uh, what is a virus to count it. So you can estimate the amount of virus within growing caterpillars. And that is what we did. Okay. So we found that the infection of caterpillars by this virus was st quite strongly dependent on the caterpillar density in the previous year. There was this delayed density dependent effect as we predicted. The infection rate was actually not very much affected by how much UV occurs. And the amount of UV that's occur occurring is based on estimates of the amount of solar radiation that is occurring and doing a standardized conversion on that solar radiation. So it's not direct measurements, but the, um, uh, the from nearby weather stations, we have information on the amount of solar radiation that is uh, occurring um, at at our uh, close to our sites. So the infection rate was not very affected by U UV. However, if we look at in the severity of infection, how many virus particles were present, we found that there was again a very strong effect of the previous density of caterpillars, this delayed density dependent effect. And then there was also a strong effect of the amount of UV radiation occurred. Basically, higher radiation left led to lower infection severities. So what we expect to happen and we observed is higher survival of caterpillars at low densities the previous year of caterpillars and high UV radiation exposure. So sites like our uh, more Southern California sites uh, that have higher UV radiation should have a higher survival of caterpillars. So the question is, what's expected to happen uh, in the future? So I've shown you, I've shown you that density last year matters to infection rate, and that infection rate was positively correlated with infection severity. UV radiation had a negative effect on infection severity, and so there was a negative effect of infection severity on survival to adulthood. Now, um, I think this virus dynamic is interesting because it leads to this delayed density dependence. It is uh, delayed density dependence because of its time lag is well known to be a potential driver of population cycles, which have been observed in our system. I'll talk about for the uh, last bit of my talk in a few minutes. And um, we, uh, we know that in this system, the UV radiation is uh, important. So, uh, the predictions for California are that UV radiation is expected to decrease uh, in the next uh, 30 or so years. And then by the end of this century, UV radiation is expected to go back to current levels. So there'll be a transient decrease in the amount of UV radiation that occurs that's strongly associated with predictions of cloud cover and precipitation. Um, so it may be that there is less UV radiation in the next 20 to 30 years. That would mean more deaths through the virus for this caterpillar. And so you have predictions in this system of increased temperatures decreasing caterpillar survival, that being compounded by increased virus mortality of these uh, caterpillars. 
So again, the reliance on uh, pop uh, the of population that well, the population dynamics of these species becomes more fragile, let's say. And the wet sites, because of their high population density, are going to experience more virus mortality than the dry sites. So it's perhaps possible that the virus dynamics or predation dynamics drive the evolution of this source to sink dispersal that we have in the system. We don't know that, uh, speculating there. Um, and that uh, the, uh, those dynamics may be, uh, may be increased through the virus, but a net decrease in density slightly through uh, temperature effects going on. And then the effects of rainfall in the system are a bit more precarious to predict. Now, let me end uh, real quick, about five minutes more of uh, lecture here. The, what about the long-term population dynamics in this system? Over the period 1986 to 2019, I think this is plotted here, um, when we had wetter years, these, the blue line here, we tended on average to have higher abundances of our caterpillars. And I've shown you some short-term data from that. But over the long term, when we get peaks in rainfall, we often saw peaks in caterpillar abundance occurring in the uh, after that time period. And there is a sort of natural time lag there with precipitation coming from November to February or March and the caterpillars being censored in about April or May after, shortly after that. Okay. So uh, we expect precipitation to be important. Now, if we look at the long-term dynamics, we also see a shift that occurred starting in about year 2000, perhaps year 2000 to 2004, somewhere in this period around here, there was a shift in the net dynamics. The dynamics went um, from fairly short-term oscillations in this period be uh, before about year 2000 to having some longer-term oscillatory dynamics after that. And we can see that better uh, in the next uh, next graph. Um, the um, I should say that the precipitation in our system is also strongly limit, linked to a climate index, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. If you look at them, there is a fairly good correlation in them. And you can see the changes in the Pacific Decadal Oscillation is what I was showing you on the bottom here. I didn't explain that very well. The sea surface temperature is also strongly linked to Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And that may be actually what's driving the temperature in our site because it's right next to the ocean. So it may be sea surface temperature or Pacific Decadal Oscillation or some other indirect effect on climate that we uh, don't have a handle on or even meteorologists don't yet. Okay, so what about changes in our caterpillars at Bodega? So we saw this switch to longer term oscillations after 2004. There were changes in the oscillatory frequency over time. We used wavelet analyses um, to look at the periodicity. And you can see that before 2004 here, the period of dynamics is something like two or three years um, in this early part of the time series. Then we have a switch to four to six year periods of oscillation after that time. The, the cycles became longer in duration after that. If we look at the precipitation changes, they seem to be somewhat similar, low frequency oscillations here, two or three years, to longer period of oscillations here, not quite as um, striking, but still there. Then if we look at the coherence of the wavelet saying basically how correlated are the caterpillars and the precipitation, then you see this uh, drop in frequency again a little bit uh, as we go forward in time. So, and that kind of change in dynamics was also being documented in the oscillations of Pacific salmon populations. And 
I was presenting this at a uh, meeting where Charlie Krebs was present, and he was talking about data on uh, some mammals, uh, some Arctic ground squirrels and red-backed voles uh, in northwestern Canada. And they also show this large change in cyclical behavior around about year 2000, 2004, again. And the, uh, with the opposite effects in his, his Arctic ground squirrels showed, ink, showed long oscillations or even no clear, not such clear oscillations after that. And snowshoe hares also went to longer oscillations, whereas red-backed voles showed uh, more pronounced oscillations after that time. So there may be a somewhat general effect of this change in climate regime that's occurring on the west coast of North America that's already showing up in population dynamics, we might speculate. So to conclude, what I have shown you is that dry years led to local extinctions of caterpillars, especially in the dry sites in this study system. Our wet sites appeared to be source populations and the dry sites were sinks. Rainfall decreases would decrease the source effect and increase the sink extinction frequency, now, it seems quite likely. Temperature increases could also increase sink extinction frequency in particular, and perhaps reduce the uh, extent to which the sources are sources through having lower population densities there. The UV decreases that are expected to occur in the short term um, may increase pathogen mortality further, um, changing the source of sink dynamics in this system and possible having increases in the oscillatory dynamics that are occurring through increases in delay density dependence in the system might occur um, as well. So uh, interesting effects there. We see that the cyclicity of the population dynamics have changed, and this is likely because of changes in a climate index, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. So very widespread. Um, climate changes sort of over long time periods. More frequent drought, droughts seen now, lower precipitation predicted by climate models and lower UV are likely to lead to more local extinctions of our caterpillars and so not great for them. So hopefully I've shown you in this system that climate can have multiple effects. There could be different effects on sources and sinks and changes in the kinds of long-term dynamics that we see in species. This is one of rather few studies of those kind of dynamics that have occurred. And it's only through the long-term study of a model system that we were able to start to get at these things. I would like to thank you for the question. Thank you for listening. And uh, if Ahimsa is willing, I will happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Marcel. Very fascinating presentation. And of course, we'll have some, some questions. Just to let you know, we had around 2,200 uh, views on Kosher. We don't know how many people are that, but we're talking about you know a, a big number. And we had around 60 people watching here on Zoom. So then uh, people who want to have make questions, please, you can type your questions on the chat box, either on on uh, Zoom or Kosher, and then we will do them for, for Marcel. Fascinating study, fascinating study system. And it took <laughs> decades to, I mean, it's, it's, it's a beautiful system. You can you can address the mechanism, and it's, it's very... Is, 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 is very stable to understand this kind of complex interactions. And, but I was thinking as, as I was listening to your presentation, uh, you know, how difficult it is to do this kind of a study in more complex systems. We have colleagues in XTBG working on, on plant interactions in tropical rainforests, in, in the canopy. And I was wondering, you know, how, how they can try to address this kind of complex processes in a, in a complex system in a tropical rainforest. So then are you doing similar work in more complex systems? Or do you think it's, it's feasible to try to address these, these things in, in more complex systems? 
Thank you for the question. So the uh, question was, can we do similar work and more complex systems? And I, am I doing that? I'd say that, I mean, first of all, this study is because of the real dedication and love of field work by Rick Carbon. Rick uh, was someone who would always just go out and look at things that were happening in the field and do small experiments to study those. He realized early on that it was valuable to have long-term data. And so, uh, uh, and actually his PhD work was on periodic cicadas with like 17 year cycles and things. So he, he really realized the value of long-term data. And it was only um, through being able to uh, go out and systematically collect this abundance that eventually it got to a point where it started to be a valuable as a time series resource. And at that point, it was a time when funding was becoming available for longer term research. The US National Science Foundation in this case started to fund long term studies and we were able to get some of that money. So we had 15 years of funding from the US National Science Foundation for doing uh, this work, which wasn't very expensive per year, but keeping it going for a long period was hard. Um, mostly in my own case, I uh, have uh, I have been very strategic about collaborating with people. I realize that I have certain I have quite good conceptual knowledge. You know, being the editor in chief of Ecology Letters, for example, gave me a very good knowledge of ecological ideas and so on. And I've taught those ideas for over twenty years to graduate students. Um, and then um, I think people have sought me out for those skills. So a good example would uh, be the Big Cat Research Group in Harbin, uh, Professor Jiang uh, uh, Guangchun's group. I, they are getting long-term data on tiger, on moose. You can track the recovery of prey populations as people were removed from the forest in forests in northeast China and then the recovery of the leopards and slower recovery of tigers or towards recovery uh, in those systems. And so and those are, you know, the data there are coming from camera traps and they're much harder to get and more. Now we're relying much more on things like meta barcoding and we're doing gut biome assays and things and the the sort of use of molecular techniques and new tracking techniques for animals moving and so on those help with these kind of things but you're right these are really hard things and doing them in tropical systems is even more difficult it's a great resource and we're extremely lucky to have facilities like XTBG in a tropical location. These tropical field stations are amazing. We see that through the Smithsonian Institute, for example, in Panama and other places around the world. And, you know, there are quite a lot of long-term fragmentation studies also available. And uh, I'll, I'll mention uh, Professor uh, Zhao Zixu at Chinese Academy of Sciences in Beijing, who's doing a long-term fragmentation study looking at changes in forest fragments in uh, uh, in central Sichuan uh, and uh, looking at the dispersal of seeds that are happening because of birds and rodents in particular in those systems. Uh, and, you know, he's been studying that system now for something like, I want to say, about 12 or 13 years. So it's getting up there in length. Uh, and, you know, it's, it is persistence and realizing the value of these data sets that allows people to do that. And, you know, I'm enormously grateful to those people. Yeah, yeah so you're, you're emphasizing the, the importance of these long-term projects that they, they accumulate and, and eventually you can see much bigger pictures through these, these uh, cumulative efforts. 
although, of course, in practical terms, require consistent funding, require people who are willing to, to, to commit to something that the, the results might be very long term, which is often for young scientists might be, you know, not, not very practical. So we need, I think, all people like 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 us, we need to 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 have this kind of vision and 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 you know play an important role there. Very interesting. I think, so um, I would, I'd also I'll add to that a little bit and say that once you have a system that has some of this information, there are amazing opportunities to do short term things with it as well, to be able to test some of these things. So like most of these studies of the predation that was going on, those are short-term experiments. There are a few months in this system. And um, similarly, in the, I mentioned the fragmentation and forests work of Zhao Zixu, that is putting out cohorts of seeds with tags on them each year and yep. tracking where those seeds go. Those are relatively short-term things. And those can form the master's project or PhD project of somebody. Um, so combining the longer term information for ideas about what's happening and then the short term experimental tests, see are those things actually happening in this system? That's a very powerful combination. And so I think you've got to realize that is something that um, these lab groups that have built up this long-term study system can start to do. You know, that would be a reason why one would go to the long-term forest plots that XTBG has, for example, because we know a lot about the recruitment dynamics in those systems now, and we can compare them to other systems around the world that have similar kinds of data as well. So, you know, enormous possibilities because of that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you for the shout out to to XTBG's uh, plot and and, and long term commitments, and also that requires good leadership, right? So then, very often, despite despite the positive or long term results, I think probably the the most meaningful results come from accumulation. So then, leaders need to think about you know building up long term, having a long term vision that will pay off and and will increase a lot our our understanding. So going back to your study system, you have shown the, the complex interactions between a, a moth, the caterpillars, the, the predators, and the, the environment and the environmental change. Have you done any work on scaling up at community level, you know, how this affects the plants consumed by the caterpillars and, and other species of moths that benefit or are affected by, by those changes in the, in the population of, of the, the tiger yeah. moth? That would be the uh, one of the next things to explore in this system. There is another herbivore in this system um, uh, that is actually capable of defoliating the same host plants that are most commonly uh, fed on. And that causes it can cause death of those plants and also can drive large scale dynamics. The extreme dynamics occurred up to about year 2000 and now seem to have vanished. That other herbivore is now present at low abundances. And quite what the drivers were of that relative to climate, we have no real ideas. There are some excellent studies of those species and parasitoid wasps as driving and parasitism by those wasps as driving the dynamics and limiting the spatial extent of outbreaks in that, uh, of that species. Um, there's, for example, a science paper by Alan, led by Alan Hastings on that and worked by Susan Harrison and other uh, really strong population dynamicists uh, in that system. Um, so uh, there's pieces of it, but it hasn't been possible to link it together. You know, with... Uh, or Rick in particular, Rick Carbon has been able to look at the parasitoid dynamics in this for this species. If anything, it seems that the parasitoids in this uh, for our um, target herbivore, the tiger moth, the parasitoids are perhaps following the dynamics of the. Uh, so when there's more hosts present, there are more parasitoid wasps. 
not that the parasitoid wasp drives the dynamics. And if anything, it seems like the ants and the virus are driving the dynamics. And uh, we knew that the parasitoid was not effective when I started getting involved in this about 15 years ago. So I haven't really talked about the parasitoid dynamics at all. They just seem to sort of follow along. Um, yeah, I mean, adding in other species, like we've got small amounts of data on uh, rodents when they were abundant as pre uh, predators of the pupae of this herbivore and so on. So it's it's not quite enough to piece it together. I mean, that would be amazing to be able to do that. Um, the work on things like the pine looper moth in uh, Norway would be perhaps one of the best systems where people have started to do that in relation to climate change. There are, you know, I think there are a few other systems in the world where that has been done, and the Pine Loop system is perhaps the best of those, but it's simpler in that it has fewer players because it's further north. Yeah. We have many questions, so let, let me just go to the to the audience questions. So we have a question from Musa from, from XTBG. So thank you for a great presentation. From the presentation, higher temperatures favor fast growth of caterpillars, but eventually have negative effects on their survival. It is interesting that the caterpillars also prefer the dry side compared to the wet side, as you explained. My question is, what could be the key driving factor that influences caterpillars to move from the wet side to the dry side? Uh, thank you for that question. Yeah, uh, the so in the similar species that I mentioned that uh, the, the, uh, it's called the tussock moth, uh, the caterpillars of that, they are strongly constrained in their distribution by the level of parasitism that's occurring from parasitoid wasps. And if you put caterpillars away from the main clump of, of uh, caterpillars, the sort of what you expect in the wet sites, and uh, in that species, and you put them out in, in little uh, uh, receptacles at different distances from that population, you find that close to the population, parasitism is super high, and then further away, it is, uh, is lower. We actually know that predation is lower at uh, the wet sites here. So the high density sites seem to have um, lower predation of our target caterpillar. And it may be that um, there would be an advantage of staying there, but the higher density of caterpillars could lead to more virus mortality. So perhaps it's the virus that's driving it. We only have virus from uh, data from two years, okay? So we can't really say with much certainty yet what's driving it. Um, it's probably something like that. Um, and the, uh, the possibility that it's linked to other things is, uh, is I think it's also out there. I, I don't feel like we have enough information to really strong to confidently say it seems to be the virus or whatever um, and you know I, I don't think it's the ant predation that's driving it in this system like it was with the tussock moth that I mentioned the other moth species um, I think it's uh, I think it's more likely to be the virus but uh, not uh, not sure so thank you for the question yeah we had a similar question from Dosa that I, I missed initially. Dosa is a professor here in, in XTBG. Yeah. And he has a follow-up question. Uh, any plausible explanation in the experiment where you release caterpillars, how these caterpillars sense the dry side? So what is the how they can detect you know the, the dry and wet gradients? It, it could be uh scent related. Uh, would be my best guess. I'm guessing it's uh, it's chemical. It's chemical. Um, more uh, uh, more volatiles released from 
wet plants than dry plants and different volatiles perhaps we don't know that uh we haven't done any olfactory work on that that would be interesting to do and it would be possible to do i think as well um we you know it does seem to be quite a strong consistent effect um the uh the possibility that uh it's uh that it's uh, that uh, you know. So we know the wet side. There is the triple benefit of uh, wetness in terms of more plants to feed on, uh, better refuges from ant predation, and less ants to eat you. So we know that's going on. Um, the uh, it makes it perhaps even more curious as to why they are. Uh, are moving though so uh yeah you know it's it's it, as i said it's a, still a bit of a mystery the virus seems like the best information we have yeah yeah so actually i'm gonna open we're gonna open the mic for people then in zoom because most of the audience is familiar so then uh, dosa aki i see you mangesha you have questions if you want to open your camera and your microphone you can you can just make your question directly to to Marcel, which I think is better than, than me reading them. So in those, I think you had one more question. Um, so I, I will just read those as uh, other question. Why did you predict that precipitation could decrease ant abundance? Um. That is uh, based on the wet versus dry site differences, that there are um, fewer of this species of ant in wet sites. There are other species of ants that have the opposite going on, but those ants don't seem to be as predatory on our caterpillars. Um, we did do some species comparisons and things with actually 10 different species um, uh, that uh, that are present at the site. Um, so we know something about different ant species and we were going from wet versus dry species uh, uh, site differences and extrapolating that to what rainfall might do. Um, it's, uh, we also have some data, not very systematic on ant abundance in wet versus dry years and the wetter years have less ants. Um, so, um, it, uh, and some of that is that uh, in wet years, the some of the ant nests become flooded. And our better predictor of the uh, caterpillar abundance was not actually directly precipitation, it was the height of the groundwater in these sites. So how flooded are they that was more important? And we have some wells that provide information on that uh, longer, more stable level of water rather than the erraticness of precipitation data. So that actually helps us get some predictable signals uh, out of this system. So there's some known effects of flooding of sites as well that I, uh, I should have mentioned earlier in my answer there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Aki, do I you want to? one question here about uh, um, do host plants possess any chemical and physical defense against herbivory and will they change with climate conditions? Uh, let me talk about host plant chemistry and defenses a bit in general. Um, one of the uh, PhD students, Patrick Grofteetza, looked a bit at uh, things like nitrogen levels in the host plants as nutritional quality. And there was a signal there, um, but it was, uh, if you looked within locations, you could predict, you could find that um, different, pl different host plants within say a wet site, you had the wetter, the wetter, uh, sorry, the higher nitrogen plants were better for caterpillars pillar growth, not surprisingly. Um, if you looked across sites, the pattern went away and there was more variation. 
there is um, not a lot going on by, so these are bush lupins. They're hairy. Um, they are readily consumed uh, when the leaves are young or old by our caterpillars. So uh, we don't think there is much chemical defense there. That is actually something that uh, Rick Carburn had done quite a lot of work on over the years. Um, Rick was actually the person who originally came up with the idea of inducible defenses in plants, for example, uh, way back in the 1990s or something. And um, so he's that was something he's been interested in and, and looked at, but there's not much going on. There is actually rather little relationship between the quantity of plant available and the abundance of our caterpillars as well, which suggests it's more the predation and the um, virus that are driving the abundances in this system rather than the defenses and so on going on as well, as far as we know. Good okay. question. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Thank Let's you. Um, I have a, another quick question, if it's OK. Yes. Um, I, I might have missed it, but um, when they are on the move, uh, caterpillars are on the move, um, do they actually have specific, uh, I mean, you, you showed us that, that there is a specific directions, but I guess you have only wet and dry sides. And then when they're getting out of wet side, obviously they're going to um, drier sides, but then do they actually make specific decision on the direction they're going? Like they're really trying to get into the drier sites or they just really random because, you know, I, we often, of course, see lots of caterpillars going around um, around the XTBG, and then my question is, uh, where, where are they going? And then how do I they mean, make decisions? So there is some orientation in that we know that if we put them in the middle of the road, mm -hmm. they go they go away from the wet sites towards the dry side of the road. Yeah. Uh, so that's so they're able to tell where the wetness site is, and it didn't work in all cohorts. It worked in sixteen of twenty cohorts of caterpillars we put out. Okay. And we don't know why the other four were different, okay? Mm. It's, it's, it's not a perfect pattern. Um, and uh, so there seems to be some orientation going on, but it's also, I, I at one point uh, in one of my rare pieces of field work myself, I marked caterpillars and tried following them. And some individuals I could follow for perhaps 50 meters, uh, others I lost in five or ten meters, and yeah. it was frustrating. It's hard to do. Um, mm. And they seem to be just sort of spreading out pretty much randomly from wet locations uh, in that case. And I was also tried releasing them just sort of in the middle of dry areas and so on. wasn't particularly thinking about wetness or dryness, where I think when I did that as well. Um, so, um, I, I think it's uh, their orientation is uh, a good question. I, d I do believe that they are dispersing away from where they're at, whether that is a general signal uh, to uh, to disperse at a certain life stage. Is there a timing cue, for example, that at a certain developmental stage, they become much more mobile would seem likely. Uh, and then there's clearly some orientation going on, but what exactly what it is, I think, is a you know that's a sort of where we're at in knowing about the system. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we have a question from Kosher, and then we will open to Mangesha and Afal. Please be ready to make your questions on Zoom after after this question. So this is from Professor Wang Gang, also from XTBG, and it's saying. When dealing with a topic like an uh, effect of biotic, abiotic uh, interactions and environmental change, or environmental change impacts on, on ecological communities or ecosystems, most work focuses on the importance, important, but also just the first step of the whole work to find the direct effects of environmental change and often get quite negative results, high extinction risk. While well, such work often lacks the secondary step, how species, in, how species interactions or ecosystems adapt to the changing environment, which may supply chance and hope. Any views on how study, uh, how study species interactions may, may adapt to changing environment with ecological timescales to arrive to new relative stability 
So then, yeah, how the systems might adapt to this change and and, and if it's the, the overall outcome, <clears throat> not necessarily negative to, to these changes. Thank you. That's uh, uh, so the longer term changes and how systems at a large scale may adapt, I guess, to uh, to change the. Um, I think there's this there's, there's two levels at which I would ask that question. One is that the species that are already interacting may interact in different ways. We modeled the effects of changes in temperature on our ant and our caterpillar and did lots of experiments in, and on the individual species, looking at their activity. We looked at the, um, uh, the growth rates of our caterpillars and the uh, net survival uh, of caterpillars uh, and the time to reach the size refuge for the caterpillar, things that we sort of knew were important in our system. And so you can study these sort of uh, short-term changes in different things whether those things are going to evolve differently and be selected for differently is a harder question, okay? And I think we've seen some of those things. I would actually say, look to the, the paleological li literature for some of that. Look at um, work, for example, on marine mollusks and their predators that leave boreholes where they attack the mollusk and how those interactions have changed over millennia and longer in ocean systems and with changes in the distribution of species that are present and you can use isotopes and things to look at changes in temperature in those system, marine systems over time. So you can get some insights into the way things change from systems like that. And we can see evolutionary changes. You know, we know from the general literature on those things that these predator-prey systems are like arms races. If we're talking about mutualistic or positive interactions, we know almost nothing, I think. You know, how do pollination interactions change over evolutionary time? We've that's the sort of thing we can start to get at, but we have rather little information about it. And I think uh, I think it's something that would greatly benefit from synthesis in the literature. Um, the second major way things change is rewiring of food webs and thinking about how climate change is going to change who interacts with who. I'm, I'm uh, uh, involved in uh, a, uh, a wonderful collaborative project uh, with uh, Professor uh, Yan Chuan uh, at uh, Lanzhou University. And we are using information about known species interactions, all vertebrates in the world, um, from extensive databases and literature surveys. We're looking at the distributions of all known vertebrates in the world, projecting those forward under clim over climate change, using machine learning and then network analyses to assemble current food, potential food webs and future food webs and saying, how might they change? And many food web are expected to become much smaller with climate change. Uh, we've reduced numbers of species interactions from that work. If uh, species are not going to freely shift their distributions, the, if species can freely move, then food webs will remain more similar to how they are now. But most likely, there we will see reductions in the size of food webs. Uh, and the length of food chains and things uh, that occur is what that kind of work predicts. Um, that's stuff that's all unpublished as yet and uh, fun to be involved in.
No, thank you for that question. I mean, it's a wonderful invitation to speculate, I think, that kind of question and something that uh, the literature on the effects of climate change on big scale things that really matter, the evolutionary changes, the distributional changes, the, the wiring of food webs and things like that is just starting to come together and is ripe for uh, synthesis for the existing studies that there are. So thank you. I think I was disconnected for a while. Yeah, <clears throat> so you for a moment. Yeah, probably for my, my connection. So then, uh, yeah, actually, I think the topics you 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 discuss are very relevant for the, the person who made the question. He's very keen on on rapid evolution and and mutualistic interactions. So then, one gun a synthesis is is needed. So then you heard from from someone who has edited very very key papers. So then, Mangesha, would you like to make your question? Oh, thank you, Imsa. Uh, thank you for your uh, nice presentation. Uh, I just have one question. Uh, I wanted to hear your opinion about the effect of fragmentation uh, on insects in general. Uh, although we have some evidence that fragmentation, um, because it produces small habitat patches, right? And that small habitat patches are now uh, supporting more plant diversity. Um, so I just wonder whether that uh, evidence is also true for insects in general, uh, if you say something on that. Sure, that's a very good question. So uh, it's a question that I thought about over most of my career, actually. How does fragmentation affect patterns of diversity in general? At one level, we expect that if species are sort of independent in their dynamics, they can only lose out and decline because of fragmentation. Whereas some species that are heavily consumed by other species or inferior competitors can actually gain from fragmentation. They might escape their competitors a little bit or escape their predators. So predation, uh, sorry, fragmentation could either have just a solely negative effect or it could actually benefit some species that are heavily consumed by other species or poor competitors. What if that is true? There's a fascinating review paper. Um, it's a few years old now, and I'm not quite sure when year it was. I want to say about 2017. It's a paper by Lenore Farig. Um, and what Lenore Farig did was a huge meta-analysis of fragmentation studies and found the net effects on species diversity were positive from fragmentation. So perhaps the view that species are actually interactive and benefiting a bit uh, is true. It could also be in the real world uh, that species that are invasive and harmful have a harder time uh, spreading in very fragmented systems. Diseases might have a harder time spreading in very fragmented systems. Or mm -hmm. it could be something like, as you suggested, uh, Mangesha, in your question, that um, the diversity of habitats, like plant diversity, might increase because of fragmentation. And whether that's true or not is likely to depend on uh, the extent of local adaptation of species and how quickly they uh, are able to adapt to local conditions. The, um, if you look at plants in California, my uh, colleague in my department, Susan Harrison, she looked at fragments of, of serpentine soil habitat throughout California and found that it was the geological age of fragments. It was nothing to do with their isolation or uh, the uh, size of those fragments that affected the plant diversity there. It was much more about geology, uh, the type of soil that was present and the age of those fragments that mattered. 
Uh, and so that might drive patterns like plant diversity, perhaps more generally. And then other species like in herbivorous insects may essentially feed off that if they're able to get from fragment to fragment. Uh, and um, so uh, that's talking about systems that have a natural level of fragmentation though. So anthropogenic fragmentation that increases uh, the uh, isolation of patches and decreases their size rapidly. We know that's really bad for some organisms, mammals that are dispersing over land, amphibians that have really small ranges, reptiles similarly, and so on. Whereas other species, like insects and to some extent birds may be less affected by that fragmentation. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think it's a fascinating question. I, I suspect there are some differences amongst organisms that are more important yeah, than we have realized so far based on what literature analyses and so on we've done and what studies we've done. Um, so great question, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we have one final question. I hope you don't mind. We are sure. over time. Yeah. This question. So then it's from Nofal Avicenna, from also from XTBG. And he says, I'm curious about the resource availability for the caterpillars in drier sites. Can the dry sites fully support the caterpillars moving from the wet sites? So it's, it's so, good enough in places. Yeah. Sure. In most years, the caterpillars can fully survive in dry sites. We do see, though, that in the drier years, and particularly when we get a drought that is multiple years, that there is extinctions of those caterpillars in those sites. That's why we we're saying there were sink uh, dynamics. And actually, the data I showed you on those sink extinctions was prior to a three-year-long drought that had really quite devastating effects on uh, these drier sites. And we really had caterpillars after that that were spreading out from um, the wetter sites. Um, the, it, I should say that it's not just the dispersal of the caterpillars that matters here. The adult moths, the, um, the females, uh, are, uh, they go to uh, hilltops to mate, they have hilltopping behavior, and they disperse out from those hilltops, and they seem to, to pretty much distribute uh, eggs that turn into the caterpillars freely amongst the wet and dry sites. And there is, does not, as far as we've been able to tell, there may not be a lot of preference going on. When we've looked at where the, the female moths go, we see them red randomly seeming to go to wet and dry sites. It's very hard to get enough data on that, but that's the general pattern we have. So there could be some sort of resetting of the system each year at mating, but not enough to actually prevent these longer term extinctions. So the annual deposition of new eggs may not be enough to um, to uh, to alter what's going on with the more localized populations in these sites uh, as well. So, yeah, good question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcel. I think we will keep it here. It has been a, a fascinating presentation and, and, and discussion and, and a very, very relevant study system and topic in, in, in these changing environments. So then I will just want to conclude by telling people, encouraging people to submit papers to wildlife letters. I guess wildlife letters like integrity conservation, you are growing, you need you need more submissions. I'm very pleased to hear you have a special issue on human wildlife conflict. Any other special issue coming soon? Uh, there's one we are putting together on uh, wildlife diseases uh, and we're putting those on both on the website soon and announcing them broadly. Um, we're excited if you've got ideas that are relevant to wildlife and conservation uh, and uh, think about us and not just integrative conservation. We, uh, the two journals like to support each other and are likely to collaborate on some projects. Uh, uh, two great journals, so you can't go wrong with these uh, either. Take a chance and uh, I think you'll like what you find if you submit a manuscript to either of our journals. So thank you. 
best inclusive world. So thank you very much, Marcel. This was a very inconvenient time for you. So then we really appreciate oh, you, so. your availability. <laughs> We're looking forward to see you in person in China and in, in Sichuan Bana in the near future. I guess you will you will drop by sometime this year. So then looking forward to see I'm you. Coming to yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. And just reminding to the audience that the, on May 7th, we'll have a, the May Integrative Conservation Webinar by, by Dr. Hua Fang Yuan. So then looking forward to see you there. And then, and thank you very much. And thank you, Marcel. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you for listening and all your wonderful Bye. questions. Enjoy thank your day. You. Thank you.